Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, The first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, This is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, But rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a uh, more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and Boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. And welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yu. And I'm Rira Yu. And welcome to our mid-month check-in episode for the month of February 2020. Uh, We're going to be going over the latest book news and publishing deals in the world of Asian American literature. As always, every month, Rira has compiled a list of the latest book deals um, sourced from from Publishers Weekly, Twitter, and um, the internet at large. Um, So, Rira, thanks again for doing that for us this time. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) Validation, yes. Um, Rira sounds very excited because this is actually the second time we're recording this episode. We're we're revealing our brushstrokes. Um, Because (laughs) (laughs) I just I feel like as as the producer, I need to admit um, that I messed up. Um, Earlier this week, we recorded this episode, and I forgot to record Rira's track. Yeah, that so, is a problem. Uh, so I dragged Rira all the way back to our studio in, in downtown LA to uh, re-record this episode on a very busy week. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, apologize for that. Uh, it's <laughs> thank okay. you, thank you for uh, for rolling with it. Oh no problem. <laughs> um, so if you have, if you didn't know already, our February 2020 book club pick is The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. Uh, we have about a week left until we discuss it on the show. Marvin, how far along are you? Not very. And I kind of resigned myself that I'm, I'm probably going to have to listen to this on audiobook. Oh my which God. Which is great <laughs> for a romance book. Uh, <laughs> I, I, had a, I had a co-worker who listened to The Kiss Quotient on audiobook in her car uh-huh. and uh, she had to pick somebody up. And oh. it was still playing, and it was in the middle of a, a middle of a sex scene, mm. and it was really embarrassing. You so make sure that you're not <laughs> like no one else is in the car when you're listening to it. I mean, this is my punishment for making Rira read about um, two dimensional folding protons. Last okay, month. but the thing is, like the book that I chose for you as punishment, quote unquote punishment, <laughs> is like it's it's very short. And it's very easy to read, and it's quite fun. I, I do admit it's it's a it's a nice um, it's I'm not struggling comprehending the concepts no. of this book. I mean, I picked <laughs> it because February is Valentine's Day, That's true. and I was like, we should read a romance novel. So yeah, we should buy into this capitalist, you know, conception of love. So since this is our second time recording this episode, <laughs> like we talked about Valentine's Day, uh. Uh, a couple days ago when we were recording this and uh, both of us were just like, yeah, Valentine's Day. Screw it. (laughs) 
You know, I got into a fight with a friend once because they were upset that I wasn't doing anything special for Valentine's Day with my girlfriend. And I'm like, we are. We're going to eat hot pot. It's a tradition. Actually, it's not. Our tradition was always soup plantation. Or sweet tomatoes. Or sweet tomatoes, for those of you who don't live in California, which... They should really change the name. They should really change the name. Yeah. You know. (laughs) I mean, I just stayed home. Like, Dan and I just made dinner. We tried to watch John Wick 3 Mm -hmm. um, halfway through. The the streaming did not work. So So we just kind of gave up afterwards. That was our Valentine's Day. It sounds very romantic. I know, right? Uh, I thought about watching P.S. I Love You Mm. because it came out on Netflix like two days before Valentine's Day. But I was like, I want to I want to reread the book before jumping into the adaptation because I don't really remember much of the finer details. And uh, one of my friends has my entire uh, Laura Jean series, uh-huh. and I don't know who it is. Oh no! And it's like I have to I have to hunt it down. So if you if you are a friend and you're listening to this and you have my books, by the way, like the first one is autographed <laughs> thanks to uh, Marvin who went to the screening for the first movie. Oh yeah, um, give it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we, as we all know, all of Reba's friends listen to this podcast because they support all her endeavors. So you know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> but we're here today to talk about the latest book deals and news from um, from the month of February. So uh, I forgot who started it off last time, but I'll start off this time. Harper Alley acquired world rights to author Tina Cho and illustrator Deborah Lee's The Tune Without Words. The middle grade graphic novel in verse follows Yunho and Juri in their escape from North Korea and the many dangers they face in their journey to freedom, including poisonous jungle snakes, corrupt soldiers, and the daily fear of being found out and sent back. Publication is scheduled for fall 2022. Wow, this is a very dark uh, uh, theme for story a for a middle grade, yeah. uh, and it's it's a graphic novel, so um, that's a little bit intense. But you know, this is something that you know happens to young North Korean refugees, um, and as more refugees come out of North Korea, like there there are a lot of them in California where we're located as well. So it it is. You know, it is a very interesting story for younger readers to uh, yeah. uh, to get to know. And I think it's really important for young readers um, to understand that, like, there are people their age going through a lot of hardships um, because of either where they grew up, where they were born. And, I mean, more empathy in this world is always going to be a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Next up, in a two-book deal, Holt Godwin bought The Very True Legend of the Mongolian Death Worms by debut author Sandra Fay. Inspired by the real-life legend of a Gobi Desert Beast, the picture book is about a family of death worms who try to convince the rest of their desert neighbors that the rumors of their razor-sharp teeth, poisonous fangs, and electrifying touch are mostly false. Publication is set for fall 2021, and Sandra Fay's second untitled book will follow in fall 2022. Uh, next up, Sterling Children's acquired road rights to Bindu's Bindis by Supriya Kelkar and illustrated by Pavardi Pillai. The picture book is about a girl who loves to match the, her Bindis to her nannies. The girl and her nanny work together to embrace their sparkle when they stand out from the crowd. Publication is set for March 2021. I love it when a uh, children's book have like grandpa grandson like grandparents and grandchildren relationships yeah. you know um as someone who does not have that <laughs> not, <laughs> not really have that considering that my grandparents uh don't live in this country mm. uh yeah it's always nice to really see yeah um next up harper voyager bought sue lin tan's own voices debut adult fantasy daughter of the moon goddess Inspired by the famous Chinese legend of the moon goddess, a young woman is forced to flee her cherished home on the moon when she is hunted by the celestial emperor for her mother's crime, and later seizes the opportunity to become a powerful warrior. Publication is slated for early 2022. (laughs) So we talked about this um, the last time we recorded this episode, but the moon goddess folk tale is like a very, I guess, popular one in in Chinese culture. Um, Do Koreans have... Yeah, there's a a bunny on the moon who makes like an immortal uh, elixir. (laughs) There's also a folk tale about uh, siblings who escape from a tiger and they're brought up to the heavens and the 
sister becomes the sun, and because she's embarrassed of, of all the people who look up at her, there are like rays, and that's why like people can't look up at the sun without being blinded. But uh, oh. I'm not so sure about a moon goddess. I really did not grow up with a lot of uh, Korean folk tales, <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, from what I remember from this folk tale, it's the story is originally there were like three suns. Above the earth, that was causing drought. And oh, the three things. body problem. Yeah, yes, essentially, you know, the three body problem. <laughs> um, and I guess this warrior king was able to shoot two of them down with his arrows, and he was gifted this like elixir for eternal life from the gods or something. And then his wife drank this elixir and floated onto the moon. And there she met uh, a bunny who also lives on the moon, and together they make mooncakes. I'm sure I got most of that story wrong, but those are the general beats. Um, and I guess the moral is don't drink weird shit. <laughs> but it's always great to see um, different folk tales being spun into contemporary fiction. Uh, which we will bring back yeah. in, our, in our book news, just <laughs> so you know. Especially in the light of we have what's takes. been happening <laughs> in the world of uh, American literature. Uh, but moving on... Avon Books acquired two Own Voices romance novels by authors Tian Kim Lam and Preslesa Williams after sending out an open submission call for compelling heartfelt romances featuring authentic perspectives. Lam's novel centers on heroine Trixie Nguyen, who is determined to make her sex toy business a success, proving to her traditional Vietnamese parents that she can succeed in a non-traditional career. Her first pop-up event is going well until she runs into the ex who dumped her. Williams' novel is a slow burn contemporary about Maya Jackson, a Manhattan based Afro Filipina wedding gown designer who learns to trust in herself and her ability to love again when she returns home to Charleston, South Carolina, and finds herself helping a widowed single father keep his struggling bridal shop afloat. Yay, more romance novels these two, written by Asian authors. Yay. These two books seem like they are pushing your buttons. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. <laughs> particularly really excited to read about uh, Lam's novel uh, about like the sex toy business because uh, Asian parents don't really do any sex ed with with their kids. They and don't like talking about it. They don't like even... They don't mention it. Like, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really excited because that that is definitely like, like a career path that all Asian parents would be like, what are you thinking? Why it's, are you doing this? It's not even what are you thinking is what... What are we going to tell? Oh yeah, well, our friends, our, at our church, friends in church, right? Because <laughs> yeah. uh, you know Vietnamese, lots of Catholic families. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it would be really funny, and also like Williams's novel. It's really nice to see a mixed race character as like the main lead. Yeah. And also just like wedding bridal shops. I love stories about those so much. So I'm really excited. I feel like both of these are also very like romance. Like, they're romance tropes, right? I don't know if they're really tropey, though. Because, like, the old the old school tropes is that, like, the woman is, like, down on her luck, struggling. Mm. Whereas, like, these two characters seem like they uh, kind of have their own business. They're confident. They're independent. They don't really need, like, any anyone in their romantic lives to, like, <laughs> to, like uh, survive. So... It's nice to see that. Nice to see that romance is kind of in their field. They call the shots mm. instead of the other way around. Um, yeah. But yeah, like again, it's it's so great to see um, romance novels being written by authors of color and marginalized communities because we're going to mention that later in our book news. Yeah, I mean, uh, just imagine the covers on these books. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, next up, Shannon Hale and Lei Wen Pham sold a picture book titled Itty Bitty Kitty Corn to Abrams, which won world English rights to the title after an auction involving eight houses. Hale and Pham are the author-illustrator team behind the best-selling middle-grade graphic memoirs Best Friends and Real Friends. Itty Bitty Kitty Corn, the new book, Abrams said, is about the importance of being seen and understood by ourselves and others and features an adorable fluffy kitten who makes herself a unicorn horn. Kitty Corn is set for March 2021. This just sounds like almost disgustingly cute. Kittens and unicorns. I feel <laughs> like that is a song somewhere on YouTube. You're probably right. Yeah. 
Next up, uh, Waka T. Brown sold her middle grade memoir while I was away to HarperCollins Children's in a six-figure deal. Pitched as the farewell meets brown girl dreaming, the memoir follows the author's journey as a Japanese-American who was sent to live in Japan with a grandmother she never knew and attend public school because her parents feared she was losing her culture. The book is set for 2021. I feel like this is the opposite of the romance novels where this is like your greatest nightmare. It is. It is my greatest nightmare. Also, if you like lose, if your parents fear that you're losing touch with your culture, like I understand like sending your kid to summer camp like my parents did <laughs> or or like, you know, just go visit for like an extended period of time. But to go to public school and not know the language, not have any friends and like just having like. I'm sure, like, the math levels are completely different, and um, it's just, yeah, that that sounds terrifying. I feel like it's one of those things where it sucks in the moment, but in the future, you'll be glad you went through it because it gives you a more wider perspective of the yeah, world. Yeah, but what if you're bullied at school, though? Mm. Like, you know, they always pick on, on like, the foreigner in, like, classrooms. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have, like... <laughs> Like most Korean American kids in in America, I went to Korean school on on Saturdays to get in touch with my culture and to not lose my language, which you know didn't really happen. I lost a lot of my language, um, but at Korean school, did not really get along with the other Koreans. So I can only imagine like how much worse it would be if. Uh, if I, for example, went to public school in Korea at that age. See, I did a um, Saturday school to learn Chinese um, for probably eight years. And all we did was just not do any homework and play magic cards. Oh, my God. I had so much homework. <laughs> my, my Korean school from, um, from elementary school to middle school, like before I moved down to Georgia, on Saturdays, it was 8 a.m., to 4 p.m. Wow. It was like, it wasn't just like learning language. You have to, you have to sit in for every single subject. Like they had Korean workbooks for every subject. It was really, really terrible. That's pretty intense. That's like some Kumon intensity right there. Man. And then I went, and then I went to Georgia and everything was like lax. And I was like, wow, like people really don't strive for excellence, (laughs) excellence down here. Um, Um, damn. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of feelings on it. Um, <laughs> sorry for, you know, ther- like I'm like hey, hey. doing therapy <laughs> through this podcast. I, I really apologize. Um, our last book deal is Tom Lin sold his debut novel, The Thousand Crimes of Ming Su, to Little Brown. The novel is set 150 years ago in the American West and follows a Chinese-American assassin hell-bent on revenge as he travels the deserts of Utah, Nevada, and California to be reunited with his wife, who was abducted years earlier. And there is no publication date for this because it just got sold. Wow. It sounds pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, congrats to Tom Lin. It sounds uh, like Taken. And meets Shanghai Noon, right? (laughs) Um, We were talking about, because we just just shared an article. um, Was it an article or was it a tweet? Uh, It it was an article written by uh, someone from Book Riot. And it was an interview with Stacey Lee, who is the author of The Downstairs Girl and also Outrun the Moon and a bunch of other Chinese-American historical novels. Yeah. And uh, Stacey Lee is actually like a third generation uh, Chinese-American. So uh, her ancestors, I guess, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, her great, great grandparents, like they came here during the railroad period. Yeah, and her family has been in the States for over a century then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we've talked about this before where, you know, I'm second generation, uh, Rira is 1.5 generation, um, Asian American um, culturally. But the history of like the quote unquote Asian American culture goes back to the 1800s. And there's a lot of stories to be told about that time because like there were Chinese people, Filipinos, um, Desi, Japanese, Japanese people. In the States during that time, and they did exist and they did live and they had to figure out how to survive in literally a society that did not want them. And so, yeah, um, I'm all for more stories about those times. Yeah, it's funny because like one of the quotes that I pulled from uh, the Book Riot interview was Stacey Lee being like, I feel alone in this crater. Like, join (laughs) me in the crater. Um, Yes, like 
Yeah. I would love to see more Asian American historical novels that are set way, way back to when we first came to this country. Yeah. Uh, but that wraps our book deals. So we're going to move on to news. Yeah, there's been quite a bit of news um, these last couple of weeks. Um, By the time you're listening some... to this, they might, it might be pretty old. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. I mean, some good. Um Some pretty bad. Um, should we start high or low? What we should, we should start high and then, right. and then go low and then end high again. <laughs> okay. um, so it'll be so, a roller coaster. Yeah, it'll be a roller coaster. So the first good piece of news we've mentioned earlier was that Netflix aired P.S. I Love You. Um, and judging from what I've seen on Twitter, a lot of people really liked it. A lot of people were cheering for John Ambrose McLaren instead of uh, Peter. Uh, secondary lead male syndrome is real, you guys. <laughs> um, but there's there's a really great LA Times interview with Jenny Han and Lana Condor, who plays uh, Laura Jean, and it's written by Jen Yamato. And if you really want to like know more about like casting and the process and what Jenny Han thought about the adaptation, that is a great place to start. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how much of that is people who already loved John Ambrose McLaren's character from the books and how many people reacted to the fact that they made him super hot. Well, they made him like a person of color, whereas like he was not a person of color in the books. Or, like, I think, yeah, yeah, I need to read the book again, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure he wasn't a person of color. I'm pre- well, me, he wasn't even the person of color in the last movie. <laughs> That's true. They, <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> they, like, they like swapped him. Um, but yeah, this, um, this is the first time I've actually um, heard secondary lead syndrome. Really? You like, haven't watched a single, like, like, not even a K-drama, but like a Chinese drama and like people... Well, I, I understand the concept. It's the first time I've heard it, like, defined for me. And I guess it does make sense because even in the adaptation of The Ghost Bride... Um, everyone, everyone's just like, Tian Bai is Yeah, they made so the, um, the ghost husband, who in the book is kind of more plain and not very good looking, into, like, the hottest guy in the series. Yeah. Secondary male lead syndrome. <laughs> no? Yeah. Didn't also happen to um, Werewolf Boy. Yep, true. Yeah. Team Jacob, right? You know, you got to make the rival hot to raise the stakes, right? (laughs) See, in K-dramas, the secondary lead male syndrome, it kind of extends to the trope where the male lead is, you know, cold and not very good to the heroine of the drama. And then the secondary male lead syndrome, they're like, you know, the secondary male is very hot, he's kind, he's always there for the girl, but the girl is in love with the main lead. So that's why it's like, it's like, why can't you be with the secondary male lead? And that's where the, you know, that that's, seems problematic. <laughs> it, it, it is, but, you know, it's fun. It's a drama. <laughs> Um, speaking of drama, um, Barnes & Noble found themselves in pretty hot drama these past few weeks. Uh, Riva, why don't you tell us what they did? Okay, so um, this piece of news is pretty old now, but we're going to go over it because I lost my mind <laughs> when they announced it. And so did a lot of uh, authors of color on Twitter. So Penguin Random House and Barnes & Noble Fifth Avenue, they stirred controversy by announcing its plan to launch classic novels with new covers featuring uh, people of color. And by classic novels, I mean like Frankenstein and um, and was it like Alice in Wonder? I, I don't remember which classics it was like exactly. Like Moby Dick, like... Um... But there were classically white novels, which is why they thought that this was a good idea. Um, but like the newly illustrated books, they were supposed to be, they were meant to be displayed uh, in like the storefront of Barnes and Noble Fifth Avenue. And um, if you've never been to that store in New York, it is humongous. Like you cannot miss it. It is, it is humongous. The display is very like there in your face. Um, but they were supposed to set this up on February fifth, and because of the controversy. They canceled the launch. And I'm going to just read uh, an excerpt from Barnes & Noble's uh, statement. 
The covers are not a substitute for Black voices or writers of color whose work and voices deserve to be heard. The booksellers who championed this initiative did so convinced it would help drive engagement with these classic titles. It was a project inspired by our work with schools and was created in part to raise awareness and discussion during Black History Month, which in which Barnes and Noble stores nationally will continue to highlight a wide selection of books to celebrate Black history and great literature from writers of color. Yeah, which I mean, it's one of those classic examples of a really well-meaning diversity initiative that just probably didn't have anyone actually of color in the room to like vet it because it's a classic, I guess, misunderstanding of the difference between diversity and like actual inclusion, right? Like they're thinking, oh, we by putting people of color on the covers, we've done our diversity job w- without thinking about like, yeah, but the text is, is still the same. Yeah, like that's the thing about their statement saying it would help drive engagement with these classic titles. You are still selling these classic white novels at like like using using diversity as kind of like a bait and switch. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like like that's not okay. And also as if like by browsing the by browsing these titles by seeing someone of color like, "Oh, I want to read this book now." Um, it's similar to how you see books with like like an oriental themed cover, right? Oh, and a lot of these covers were pretty oriental. Uh, <laughs> Did you see the one of I Dr. S- Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? I saw it was it was not good. Um, <laughs> but it's just like you see you see a book cover that I don't know has like a Japanese kimono, for example, and mm. it's just like oh, like this is diversity. But then you look at the name and it's. It's not by an Asian author. You're using an exotic setting to sell to a white audience. And that is my main issue with this. Like, it is so that they can make more money and not really include people of color into the conversation. And I guess it's kind of a similar issue that was brought up during the whole American Dirt controversy, which is like, there are adaptations of these classic texts that exist in the world. There's no Julie Dow's adaptation of the Snow White um, Evil Queen story. Forest of, Forest of a Thousand Lanterns. Yeah. Uh, there's Tara, Tara Sims' uh, uh, Scavenger, Scavenge, Scavenge the Stars. I'm sorry if I got the title <laughs> wrong, but that is a queer adaptation of Count of, uh, Count of Monte Cristo. And it just came out this year. So yeah. we've been doing it for a very long time. And it's really, really unfortunate that, you know, they... Yeah. They just didn't do the work. I don't know. There needs to be more than just a surface level like patronizing of of our our need to be seen, right? Yeah, it's yeah. it's a lot of good intentions but, you know, Slop- didn't yeah. yeah, sloppy execution. I feel like this period has just been a lot of like you make a mistake uh in terms of like what is promoting diversity. Like what is the actual what does that work look like? Yeah, right? what does what, that work yeah. look like? And just like a lot of missteps. But with these missteps, I hope that publishing houses do better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that <laughs> that kind of transitions well into our next piece of news. Uh, Lee and Lowe published their 2019 diversity baseline survey. Oh, and uh, their can't wait. <laughs> uh, and their first survey was released back in 2015, which. Um, contributed to a lot of the diversity initiatives, um, such as Own Voices and DV Pit. And um, this is this is their second survey. They're trying to do this every four years. And um, there are some there are some good observations, but a lot of the um, statistics really do worry me. So I'm just going to briefly go over uh, what their survey has found. And you can look at the entire survey um, on Lee and Lowe's website. So a bit of good news, the percentage of white people in the executive level, or I guess people who identify as white, sorry, uh, dropped from 86% in 2015 to 78% in 2019. And a percentage of people identifying as straight dropped from 89% to 82%, and percentage for people who identified themselves as disabled increased from 4% to 10%. So the latter statistic was a lot higher. And I'm guessing that's because mental health 
has, you know, the awareness for it has gone up. And a lot of people identified like depression, anxiety, those as part of disability. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that's why the percentage went up. It's nice that people at the top are getting more diverse. I mean, there's two scenarios, right? One is that the the top levels, executive levels, or the leadership levels are actually becoming more diverse. Or or the other scenario where the industry maybe just is just growing and then there's more positions. So, you know, um, a lot of the major publishing houses have created more diverse imprints in the recent years, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. And so you'd hope that these imprints that aim to, you know, um, support um, own voices authors are led by diverse people. You never know, but the yeah. hope is that they are. Um, if you're curious, um, so like, the percentage of Asian, Pacific Islander, and South Asian, Southeast Asian uh, people in publishing. And that's not just like uh, editorial, but it's like editorial, marketing, all of the departments pretty much. We are at 7%. 76% identify as white. And the really, the really sad thing is 7% is higher than all of the other marginalized um, communities of color that that were included in the survey. So while 7% of the publishing industry are of Asian, uh, Pacific Islander, South Asian descent, um, only 5% are African American, Black. Mm. And um, it's even... It's even lower for um, Native American, which is less than 1%. So there's definitely... (laughs) A lot of room for improvement. A lot of work that could still be done, for sure. Um, And also, editorial is even more white than before. Uh, (laughs) The percentage of people in editorial who self-identified as white rose from 82% to 85%. And that is... And that is like a red flag to me because these are the people who who buy the books at auction, who says this is the manuscript that we're going to publish and say that, like, for example, American Dirt, like that was bought by an ed- like an editorial team because they thought that it was it was an important topic. And yeah, it's just it it is worrisome. And the last Notable observation that I wrote down here is that publishing interns are actually way more diverse than the entire industry itself. Of the interns surveyed in 2019, 49% identified as by POC and 49% are also um, identified as part of the LGBTQIA spectrum. So there is a lot of diversity Amongst the interns, but again, publishing is in New York City and it is expensive. Yeah. It, like not a lot of people can afford these internships, even with grants. And also there's no uh, there's no guarantee that these interns are going to be hired uh, after their internship ends because it's publishing and the, <laughs> and the industry is uh, not – really growing that much in terms of jobs. Yeah, I mean, the hope is that, um, obviously, the industry is has been traditionally very homogenous. So moving up has always been tough. But, I mean, the fact that there are so many, like, the fact that the intern class, like the entry-level class is so diverse gives some hope that you know the next wave of editors and publishers moving up the the ladder is going to look a lot more diverse and a lot more um you know inclusive i mean the hope is there we'll see if reality lives up to it but it's good to see that at least uh, it shows a that um publishing companies are you know hiring or bringing on more diverse interns and b there are more diverse people interested in moving into publishing I'm I'm a cynic, so uh, <laughs> don't ask me uh, about like whether yeah. that's a good sign or not. Um, but yeah, I I really do hope that you know change like this survey, which is going to be taken again four years from now, that there will be significant number changes. Yeah. Um, and 
our last negative piece of news, <laughs>、um, because we don't want to end on a bummer. The full board, actually, no, this is this is pretty good news. Sorry,、uh, the full <laughs> in the the Schadenfreude type of like. Of of news, right? Yeah, that's that, that, yeah.、Uh, the full board of the Romance Writers of America (RWA) resigned on February twelfth and announced that there will be a special election to fill the board seats for the remaining term until August, and the voting is happening around March. And、uh, if you haven't followed the RWA controversy, there's a lot of articles out there. We are not experts. But pretty much, it stemmed from、uh, the censure of romance novelist Courtney Milan,、uh, who voiced、uh, pretty much concerns about、uh, a romance novel written by a white author who wrote very harmful stereotypes of Chinese people in their text. So,、um, yeah, it's kind of a really big deal that the entire board has resigned. And、uh, that the Rita Awards got canceled. It means that they are taking pretty big steps、uh, to figure out, like, how to fix this mess. And the fact that the RWA was founded by, you know, like authors of color. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a whole board stepping down. That is a big deal. That's something that doesn't really happen. Also, like their convention.、Um, They have they they have like mentor sessions. They have、uh, panels where romance novelists who are more established they give advice to、um, up and coming writers, and、um, like it it is really worrisome because I've heard some horror stories from romance novelists who are Asian because they've said like white authors have said oh you need to change the main heroine to like a white girl because otherwise you're Target audience is not gonna, I like not gonna relate with.、Oh. Ugh, it's it's just so bad. Yeah, I mean, it's the type of horror stories you hear from writers of color that they get from, you know, well-meaning editors who think they're helping and think they're improving the story,、um, but kind of just miss the point of why the story needs to exist in the first place. And so, yeah, um, again, um, being the Slightly more optimistic person in this duel. I look forward to seeing the changes and seeing progress because it's not like they resigned their term right after being elected. I mean, they only had a couple months left, anyways. So we'll、mm. see how we'll see how this turns out. And、uh, our final piece of news is that Y'all West lineup was announced. Yeah,、um, this is something we talk about going to every year, and we. Don't because Reber and I both live on the east side of LA, and this happens on the west side. Which,、um, for those of you、uh, who don't understand what that means, it essentially it's like it's an, another state for us. It's it's real bad. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's not an excuse. We probably should go. I have gone one year, and、uh, that was pretty fun. There were a lot of panels that I went to that. Uh, were pretty interesting. One of the panels that I went to was、uh, a group of authors brought in their worst piece of writing, <laughs> and they read it out loud.、Uh, it was kind of like a writer's edition of Mortified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was pretty fun. I mean, looking at the lineup this year,、um, definitely a lot of our friends, a lot of people that have been on the podcast before, and also that we've covered, are going to be there. So you know, there's there's every year we talk about going. This year might be the year that we actually go. Or at least one of us actually goes. Probably me. I'll probably probably、go. you, <laughs> considering that you have the audio equipment. <laughs> But yeah, Rio, who's gonna be at Y'all West that we、um, that we're that, familiar that, that, with? That we care about, I guess.、Uh, no, no, we care about all of them. There are some great authors、uh, who are gonna be there.、Um, but just to highlight、uh, those who are of Asian descent,、uh, we have David Yoon, who is the author of Frankly in Love. Uh, F. C. Yi, the author of the Iron Will of Jeannie Lo, Abigail Hing Wen, who has been on this podcast,、um, author of Love Bo- Love Boat Taipei.、Um, we also have Maureen Gu, who is also on this podca- podcast,、um, and she's the author of Somewhere Only We Know.、Um, we also have Maggie Tokuda Hall, the author of The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea. 
Tara Sim, the author of Scavenge the, St- Scavenge the Stars, which we mentioned earlier. Marie Liu, author of Rebel and also Warcross and the Legend series. She's a pretty big deal. Yeah, she also wrote Batman. Yes. Um, we also have Hafsa Faisal, the author of We Free the Stars. Melissa De La Cruz, the author of The Queen's Assassin. We've- and one of our uh, book club picks. Yes, uh, yes. Something in between? We read that in like our first year of book club. Yeah, pretty early yeah, on. Yeah, pretty early on. Melissa De La Cruz is one of those authors who like churn out a she's book every year. She's pretty prolific. She, she like wrote she's like so the, fast. like Hamilton series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tracy Chi, the author of We Are Not Free and also the Reader series. And uh, Minty Das, the author of Brown Girl Ghosted. There's probably going to be more as uh, the festival grows closer and closer. I'll probably try to go because I'd love to just talk to most of these authors there and maybe get some tape, maybe get some interviews um, and experience Y'all West for the first time. Um, I'll be probably the oldest person there. That is so not true. (laughs) That is really, really not true. I was so surprised that there were like people older than me at this festival. Um, But there are a lot of book bloggers, young and old. Um, There are booktubers. There's a lot of um, young readers as well. It's a great chance to get arcs. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, So stay tuned. We'll probably bring you some content from there. You you promised them. But. I did. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like, on tape now, and we yeah, actually, we're actually, actually recording. Have to do so it. I have to do it. Um, and I guess on that note, that'll also do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Thank you so much for joining us as we went over the latest book and publishing news in Asian American literature. Um, a reminder again that our February twenty twenty book club pick is The Kiss Quotient by Helen Hong. We'll be discussing that book in our next episode. So if you've finished the book and have any thoughts, please um, let us know on our Goodreads forums. We'd love to incorporate your feedback into our discussion as well. And yeah, on that note, thanks, Riva. Right, bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This episode was hosted by Marvin Yue and Riva Yu and produced and edited by Marvin Yue. This podcast was recorded at the Potluck Podcast Studios located within the Visual Communications offices in downtown Los Angeles. You can learn more about Visual Communications and their programs such as the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival by going to the website at vcmedia.org. Thanks also to the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American host podcasts that Books and Boba is a proud member of. You can learn more about our fellow Potluck Podcasts by checking out the website podcastpotluck.com. Hey, Brian. Did you go to Saturday school as a kid? I sure did. Did you? Totally. Well, at our podcast, Saturday School, we don't teach a language, but we pass along the culture that we do know. And that's Asian American pop culture. Ada is a journalist, and I'm a professor and film festival programmer. We've watched a lot of great Asian American movies, and we want you to watch them too. Come listen to us as we look back at the pioneering films that have led us to today. 